also bring up her slides while she's coming up. And here we come. Michelle, you're on stage. How are you doing? How are you doing? Good. Um, so uh, you're in, now if you're in Seattle or? You're I'm in Seattle. It's right, well, south end of Seattle is really close to Renton. So I actually okay. live in Seattle. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I tell people I'm from New York, but I'm actually, you know, about a half an hour outside of New York. And maybe just describe, you know, what are some of the, yeah, some of your school has done some really interesting things and people come from all over the world to see how your school is run. What, what prompts people to come to rent to your school? One of the things we do is um, combine different age groups. That's not very typical in many schools where students are outside of their same age peers, that they're mm -hmm. doing cross-age mentoring. So older kids are working with little kids um, so that mm -hmm. the technology is far from in the computer lab, but it's also far from just one single subject, one age group, a homogenous group. And so mm -hmm. that's one way we help build a culture of using technology for good is helping them see the context of the projects that they're doing with younger people, that they're learning to be teachers and not just learners. Hmm. Fascinating. So, and what, what started your interest in artificial intelligence? I've been doing things with technology for quite a while um, and yeah. researching it in the classroom. And I would say as far back as 2011, when we started doing Portal 2 in the classroom um, and looking at the types of robotics that they were using inside that game. It's a first person perspective game where it's a logic and puzzle game. And I started doing things with philosophy with my students and trying to understand um, the storyline with them, the game design, um, the allegory of the cave. And some of those pieces were compelling at that point. But I saw it more in terms of in the future when the robots take over the world and we humans are the test subjects. Um, and I know that's part of fiction and pop culture, but I didn't delve into it until the last two years when I started seeing implications for um, future technologies and the changes in job employment. And when I started reading those articles that were saying 40% of our jobs will be placed, replaced Christ. by machines, and some mm -hmm. of those things got me thinking, well, if we're trying to prepare kids for a future where they're working in different types of occupations, what skills will they need so that I can start working with them now to prepare them for that? And that's when I started looking into it more. Okay, fascinating. Um, and so uh, that what you've picked up in the last two years, now you've been able to pull together in a book. Yes, Right. a lot of the foundational pieces are based on who we are as people and what types of skills will benefit us regardless of the types of technology that exist. We do know that technology will continue to change. So it's not as much about a specific type of platform, technology, device, tool, as it is our mindsets of how we work with these things as society keeps rapidly changing. Mm -hmm. And in the, earlier, we were, there were three of us who were, who were talking and you mentioned that you have a background in neuroscience. Just you, you may be getting into this later on, and I hope I'm not spoiling anything by asking. But yeah. what are some of the differences that things that you've learned from neuroscience to the what we now see that machines can do with artificial intelligence? I would say one of the things that we know the brain is so much more complex than people predicted when they wanted to map it years ago, and even mine, the more. <laughs> yes. The more we learn about the human brain and how it functions, the more we realize there still is to learn. And so the idea of being able to know all the mysteries of the way that the mind work, works and functions, um, and then if we could just replicate that in machine, there's so much more complexity to that because the way our brains are wired, the plasticity of our brain, the way that we process emotion and memory and culture and all those sociological features that go in with ecology and ethics, um, those take on a different feature and function and role than a traditional um, development of a machine. So we mm -hmm. know that one of those things is our ability to transfer knowledge from one domain to another. Our brains have the capacity to do that, where at this point, machines aren't very good at it. For example, even in a production line, for example, um, car production, if there's a wire that goes in front of a machine that's being able to automate a process, a human would quickly know that they could move that wire out of the way and that process can continue. But a machine that's not programmed to notice that 
or to know what to do with that will stop and it won't know to go forward because something's wrong, something's out of the ordinary. So we know that in those factory settings, there are still humans that are walking through to see if something goes wrong. Is it as simple as just moving a wire out of the way? Um, at a more complex level, I know someone who works for Google and he has a background in um, programming for AI. He said to imagine that you have a five or six year old child that you can teach one thing to and they can get really good at that one thing and they can do it over and over thousands and thousands of times. But if you ask that same child to transfer it to something else or to apply it and create, that level and ability isn't there yet. Like a machine can learn how to play tic-tac-toe and beat an, a human. A machine can learn how to play the game Go that's even more supposedly complex than chess. And yet if you ask that program to then play tic-tac-toe that's even more simpler, it may not be able to transfer that learning from one strategy to the next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. So I'm looking at the time and I've already taken up uh, 12 <laughs> of your minutes. So I'm going to uh, expand the slides and um, I'll just I'll let you go. We can move to the next slide, actually. OK, I can do that. Yes, there we go. We can move to the next slide. Um, so this background, I decided to highlight this picture because looking at the way a five and a six year old interacted with this robot in our middle school classroom actually changed the way that I started thinking about approaching this book. They immediately walked up to this robot who's about their height and tried to start interacting with it like they would another human. They tried to talk with it. It didn't respond. The middle schoolers had programmed it previously to be able to say hello and to move its hand and wave but they weren't getting any interaction. So these two kids were talking together and trying to make sense of this and say, is it a good robot or is it a bad robot? And they were trying to find out if the lack of response meant that it was going to do something sinister. So then they couldn't figure out what it was. They looked for power cords, they looked for loose screws. And the piece that they were missing is that there was someone that needed to program it. That's compelling because if we have young kids who have either watched TV, that they've watched movies, heard stories about robots that interact as humans do, we start thinking about what will they expect these machines to be able to do in the future? Will they have the same fears that we do as adults? But then we also think about as adults, there are sometimes we wonder if machines are more complex than they actually have the capability to do. We do know that the things that are being developed are rapidly increasing, but it's still not at the level where it can replicate the way a human interacts, talks, laughs, has humor, as I mentioned, suggesting the um, development of creativity and transferring subject matter across different domains to come up with new solutions. We don't have that level of complexity. And when I spoke with experts who have been working in the field since the 1970s, they believe that that level of complexity won't come for anywhere between another 50 and 100 years easily, if at all. And part of that does have to do with the way that humans have a sociocultural um, ability to learn, that we learn from other humans in a way that machines don't learn the same way from other machines. So I highlighted this because I started the book looking at how young kids want to interact with technology and then asking ourselves, what do we know about AI? And there's so much um, confusion surrounding that term and what exists and what doesn't exist. So I sought out different ways to try and disambiguate it. I talked to people and said, what does it mean to you? How do you come up with a single definition? And through the research, I found that there's not one simple, clear, easy way to define AI. Some people said it's because the more complex that we get, the more those original things start to feel like just normal technology as opposed to replicating human intelligence, a calculator, for example. At one point, people thought that a machine that could calculate numbers the way that we see as just a normal tool, they thought that was replicating human intelligence. But as that became more ubiquitous, people thought that that's just normal piece of technology. And that bar got raised higher for what we count as artificial intelligence. So basically, we're looking at machines that can replicate the way a human thinks or processes to some extent, although there are a lot of variations in the way people talk about it. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. There we go. So I think we wanted to, um, did you want to break off Mitch for this one or have it as a group or have people well, jump in here? So, so what I thought is um, when we, 
you know, I guess people could read the questions, but um, if we start off, let's say even with the first question, you know, what are some so what are some common perceptions about artificial intelligence we get from the media and films and how might this have influenced the children's behavior? So what I'd, what I'd love is for somebody to, to click on that raise hand button um, and, um, you know, and actually let me, and, and, and talk about this with us. But um, while we're waiting for somebody to raise their hand, um, oh, you know something, let me just... You know, let me let me just again. You know, here's here's the screen. Uh, the screen, and um, you see that you have um, one of the that avatars is, is the raised hand. So, uh, so somebody please uh, raise your hand. But in in the meantime, um, you know, I'll just say, you know, it seems to me that a lot of the AI we see in movies has robots that look like people and then also act like people. Um, and what I think what we're seeing in industry is even more th things that don't look at all like people, but things that, um, that just do things or even things that aren't, don't have a body. You know, we see artificial intelligence that's embedded in software. Any, any thoughts? Or any thoughts from people in the audience? And are you seeing people te text people? Are you seeing people text in responses? I saw a message asking for a little bit more elaboration on neuroscience. And so I um, define that as it's the study of the human brain and understanding how that works. Neuro referring to the brain. Okay, and I'll just, let me just, you know, read that second, or actually you could read the second question. Um, and let's see if we can get a volunteer to come up and talk to you about that second question. So the two kids who were trying to interact with that robot were Leela and Cub. Um, so if young children like Leela and Cub are now expecting to see intelligent interactions with a plastic robot that was only programmed to do very simple tasks like wave and say hello, what will they expect to see as high school students? And we think about our lives now as adults and what we imagined was possible. It may have been easier for us to say, oh, that's not real, that's just a movie. But for the kids now who are interacting with technology at a different level than we did, what will they expect to be able to do that we wouldn't have even imagined by the time that they get to high school? So I would suspect that they would think that robots could do all their homework for them. <laughs> That's one of the most common things when we ask kindergarten students, just even for the last several years, asking kindergarten students, what do you wish a robot could do for you? Homework is one of the top things that they want them to do. Clean their room is another one. Oh, so I'm going to bring yeah. Sarah up. Yeah, Sarah up. She raised her hand. Hopefully Sarah has a microphone. And, and uh, Sarah, do you have a microphone? It's, oh, it says you're connecting. Uh, let's give you another second to see if this connects. Um, Darn. Okay. Um, maybe Sarah, you, uh, it, this, um, you may not have a maybe. microphone, uh, but maybe what you can do is, uh, if you have a comment, uh, oops, I'm going the wrong direction. Uh, if you have a comment, maybe you can open up that text box next to your avatar and, and type in the text box right there. Okay. Um, anybody, uh, anybody else want to give it a try with a microphone um, on what do you think kids today will expect or what can we expect for kids when they're, who are young today when, when they're in high school in terms of artificial intelligence? It's also to me interesting how um, kids are, you know, using, um, you know, Amazon and, you um, you know, and Google Home to like, oh, uh, Alexa, play this or, you know, play this movie or play this song for me or um, Alexa, um, what is the capital of Connecticut, <laughs> you know, as, as part of their homework? Did you yeah. um, see the, there's a YouTube video that's been going around with a little girl trying to play the song Baby Shark with Alexa and doesn't know exactly how to pronounce it. 
And she keeps trying to ask Alexa, Alexa, pay, play baby shark. And so it doesn't quite come out with a linguistic articulation and she's uh, not able to get it to play until the mother comes in and plays that. Uh, ah, okay. Oh, so um, this Wendy, you had your hand up and uh, yeah. Let, can yeah, I don't you? know if you can, can you, can you hear me? Perfectly. Yes. Perfect. Oh, great, great. Well, so when you called Alexa, my Alexa, answered your question about Connecticut and mm -hmm. uh oh wow uh, yeah <laughs> she's right over the counter there um so Michelle one of the questions are not questions so much but I have grandsons and I think um one of the things that I know you've probably read about um and I I, I know I read and was very concerned with was the way we handle artificial intelligence via things like Alexa, I remember reading an article that was how you speak to Sorry, Alexa. Sure. Alexa's not a human being, but you have three and five year olds around you. And the way mm -hmm. you interact, it's like, you know, people get mad because it's, right. it's, it's AI, it's a voice, not a real person. I've really worked hard to be very polite around Alexa. And um, I, I just think those are kind of some of the issues that kids, I think, are facing. And I, I've watched with my own grandsons as they use Alexa. Um, yes. That interaction is very important that, you know, it's AI, it's artificial, but how does it carry over to real interactions with okay. human beings? Exactly. Because if you start to isolate something and assume that this is um, separate from me, it's starts feeling that way if you're interacting behind a computer and you feel like that's the same thing, I'm just talking to a computer as opposed to a human. And as you mentioned, that transfer does happen with kids. And I think that goes back to who we are as people and how do you treat people with respect? How do you talk with people? And those conversations can happen with kids early on. Um, and asking why would you choose to use that tone of voice there? Would you do that with another person? I've talked with a couple of people who mentioned that um, if at some point machines have the ability to have cognition, that they want to be the ones who treated them with respect and the robots don't revolt on them because they know that they <laughs> treated them with respect. And I'm wondering, have you ever been frustrated with, you know, with Alexa? You know, have you ever tried to get something from Alexa and like just given up? So is that Michelle or me? You, you. Oh no, I love Alexa. Um, I think my my grandsons have a hard time because they go on and on and on. They don't understand how to make a short question and be be very precise. So they get pretty frustrated. Uh -huh. but, you know, we're in the early early years of this. I, it's going to be very different in a couple of years. Yeah. So Alexa has that, trained you very well. It has. Yeah. <laughs> we know that child. One question I'd love to have, maybe you're going to get to this, or maybe you know nothing about it, but um, one, uh, one of my colleagues, I think, is is um, actually online uh, somewhere, Luis Perez, and we're very interested in the use of bots. I don't know if you have anything to add there, but we'd love to, you know, hear a little more about, I, I kind of know what bots are, but I'm not sure how they're being used, so... I could give an example, and I didn't put this specifically in the slides, but I'm talking about a couple conference coming up. I met mm -hmm. with an educator in Australia, um, and he has used Microsoft Teams that has a chatbot built in. He has over, I believe, five or 600 first-year engineering college-level students. And that amount of questions that those students are asking, the same types of questions over and over again, is really overloading for TAs. So he's worked on programming that chat bot to identify some of the most common questions and the machine learning behind it starts um, recognizing those similar questions over and over again. He has that linked so it can direct students to the recorded lectures that he's created. And then the um, computer, um, excuse me, I'm blanking out natural language processing um, allows them to be able to find that specific location in the video. So when the student asks a question, it can direct them to the exact minutes in the video so they can get that question answered by rewatching the video. If the machine learning hasn't known how to answer a question and the student replies back, no, I don't, 
that didn't answer my question. It essentially um, triages it and sends it to the next level of person who's an actual human who can respond to that. So the way he's using that in education, I find really fascinating because it's helping remove some of the workload that is the repetitive type of question, but at the same time, helping direct them to do something that's very human and go back and research and practice. Um, at a basic level, I talked to some people who had started programming chatbots in the 1970s, and they talked about the difficulty level of going from scratch to doing something that can respond and understand or seem human. Um, there are some people who are using it in other, like Georgia Tech University, that they're using those with students in the classroom as well um, to help facilitate the learning process and direct them. So there's a broad range of applications and the technicality to get it to that level that you need it. You also need massive amounts of data, which work better when you've got classes of 500 students constantly inputting questions over multiple semesters. Um, if you're in a classroom of elementary students, for example, and you have 30 students, it's going to take you a lot more time to start gathering that type of data to get it, an accurate type of response that will be tailored to your classroom. In terms of kids building chatbots, we know that there are some templates, um, some basic programs that that foundation is built and you can adapt it to something that you want it to be able to do. Rogue chatbots, um, there have been some that have been set free on Twitter and they started following, um, I would say young adults and teens and picking up on their language. So when that chatbot responded back, it started saying some quite offensive things because it was picking up and learning from the language of those young people. So these, these all bring into question, um, not only how do you program a chatbot, what's the purpose for it? Is it going to make your life more efficient versus more work for you? What's the best balance between a human responding versus a machine responding to streamlined processes. And there are a lot of unknowns still in that field, because like you said, those are all relatively, um, I want to say recent, except for the fact that people have been working on it since the 1950s. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's a lot of information. Thank you. Well, thank you, Wendy. Okay. So um, do you want me to, to move on or sure. see if somebody yes, else wants on. to come up? Okay. Okay. Let's, Move on and go ahead. So we actually have been talking about this one for a bit. And I wanted to point out that, yes, there will be machines that replace the types of jobs that are um, mundane, uh, some of the ones that are repetitive, because machines can do some of those things. We know already at airports there are kiosks that have replaced um, checking in baggage. We know that there are kiosks that have replaced um, picking up a rental car. But what was interesting in the airport in the summer of this last year, I noticed that those kiosks were completely empty and people were bypassing those and choosing to stand in line for over a half an hour to talk to a human being versus working with those kiosks. So that brings into question, what do we value more, our time or interacting with a human? Will that shift? And what does that mean for the types of jobs that will be replaced? Um, we do know that if the machine and technology isn't smooth enough, that that's off-putting to some people and they'd rather wait to be able to work with someone directly. Um, but we also know that if we have a way of trying to help our students um, fill in the gaps that machines can't, they're going to be more valuable in the job market. That can be in creative fields. It can be in fields that understand cultural competencies. Um, some of the medical field people that I talked with said, as they're using AI to help with not only diagnosis, but working on decreasing medical um, interactions between drugs, they're needing very highly collaborative teams, people who know user interfaces, the patient themselves, they need the caretakers, they need the family members. Those are all very different perspectives and they would have very different types of training. So for people who can work with and understand how to find parallels or um, interactions between those very different fields, that type of skill is going to become increasingly valuable. And to know how to harness the things that technology can do well, and then balance that with what humans can do better. So you could kind of say, did, you know, did, um, does a shovel replace a person's work? Exactly. Because before shovels, you had to dig, but with a shovel, a person can be a lot more effective. And I hear, <coughs> You know, what I'm gathering from what you're saying is that um, artificial intelligence is likely to make us all much more effective and leverage us uh, yes. 
than it is to primarily replace us in the workplace. And that's the most common thing that I've heard from the people that I have seen um, give substantial evidence to the research that they've worked on, the use cases, the things that fail, the things that work. And those are also the people who requested that I do the best I can to decrease the hype surrounding it. Hype going in, um, instilling fear in people, and also hype in um, overpromising what it can do at this point. That it is a very beneficial direction, but to not overpromise and then be disappointed if it can't deliver in the way that we hope. So I don't think that you know social media site um, is going to get very many clicks if they say artificial intelligence not likely to replace jobs, right? Right. Exactly. Okay. On the other hand, and if they, they say forty percent of jobs going to be replaced, pe people might right. click on it and read it. So if you can capture emotion and if there are extremes that we know from psychology is more likely to catch attention, that is one way that AI is being used in things like YouTube channels. I heard a speaker who did a TED talk and I'm blanking out on her name right now, but I heard her in New York and she talked about how she started to notice typing searches into YouTube would quickly bring you to extremes. So instead of just like jogging, it would bring you into marathons. In political spheres, it would be something basic and bring you into a really extreme direction because that gets attention. But she said the danger with that is that young people will quickly go from something that's uh, more balanced and neutral to something that's far extreme and at especially really impressionable times. They may think that's all there is to the conversation. So as educators, it's going to be absolutely crucial for us to help challenge those ideas and get them to look for counterexamples, much like a research field would ask you to do. Good. And again, if, if you have other thoughts on this or, or if you want further amplification on these ideas, um, <laughs> type something into the text box or, or raise your hand and we can bring you up to, to, uh, to talk to Michelle. Sarah wrote that she read an article that young children actually think that a small person is in um, the home AI, things like Alexa. And I can see how that would make sense because I even remember um, when I was teaching with co-teaching with early childhood, there are a lot of kids that thought that people were inside of the TV. So that would be <laughs> expected from a lot of kids to think there's a little person in there. We can move on to the next slide okay. unless someone has a question. This was one of the most helpful things to um, disambiguate understanding how AI fit with all these words that I was seeing in articles and magazines, especially in uh, mainstream media. I started asking people, I was like, so is machine learning the same thing as AI? Is what's robotics? Is it AI? Is it not AI? Because I'm seeing both. What about cognitive systems and cognitive computing? And I was grateful to be able to have these conversations. And this is not my model. But um, as we were talking, he mentioned that you imagine that there are three separate domains people have been really pouring a lot of energy into. One of them is machine learning, and that has to do with the information world. Those are the types of data that we're collecting, the information that we're gathering to see patterns in. And that ability for a machine to learn and find patterns and make suggestions is in that domain of machine learning. The cognitive systems would be examples like IBM Watson when it was um, up against a human playing Jeopardy or um, playing chess people so that it's interacting with the human world in some way. And then robotics interacting with the physical world. So the hope is that if all three of these domains intersect, that sweet spot in the middle would be where AI shows the most replication of a human, where we're able to communicate with the world, where we're able to see patterns, where we're able to move and pick things up and negotiate different physical spaces, but then also think and process. I thought it was really interesting though that he said that there's a lot of joke going on with AI being almost integrated because these things are so far from being integrated in a way that makes sense, that they can talk to each other and then have those pieces overlapped. Sometimes they'll be like machine learning and cognitive systems together, sometimes the machine learning and robotics, but not in a way that they're fully um, working so that a robot would appear to be a human with the cognition, with the ability to process those things and be able to carry out a daily um, just basic tasks like brushing your teeth or standing up and walking. And I've heard people say that little kids who are first learning to walk have a smoother ability to coordinate 
then it is easy to be able to create a robot to do that type of thing. Although there are a lot of, um, prog there's a lot of progress. There's like Boston Dynamics that's working on smoothness of motion, for example. Um, the other thing that he pointed out, and he said he appreciated that I had a background in psychology and social psychology. And this is the part I was mentioning earlier that um, humans learn from humans and we learn from tradition and culture and society around us that shapes the way that we think and remember and process things. Anything from like a mnemonic device, um, being able to recall memory from a visual image in a different way. Those things are not the same as the way that a machine processes. And he believes that there may be things that we haven't even considered yet that are necessary for AI to appear more human-like and to be able to interact with us in a way that a human does. And that's why he was mentioning it's a lot farther out than it may appear at this time, just like the first year that the group of professors got together and thought if they worked really hard over a summer, they would be able to create a machine that could replicate and trick a human to, um, to think that they were interacting with another human. Um, there are waves that it seems like there's more progress and all of a sudden it drops off. I was surprised to realize how long this has been going on because even within the last five years, I thought it was relatively recent development. But part of that is because of the AI winters and they call them AI winters because um, people will develop a lot of hype and overpromise what can happen. And when it doesn't have that ability or capability, mm -hmm. people lose interest and feel like, well, this is a bunch of sci-fi and why would I bother trying to pursue it? Funding dries up. And that's one of the hopes this round that there's not um, too much overpromising where people lose hope again and then just give up on researching and moving forward. There are so, so I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, well, you know, part of this is to understand where we are going as a society and what kind of jobs we should have kids prepare for. And, not, and in preparing kids, you know, there's a lot of talk about teaching kids coding. Right. So, but it seems to me like, Coding is a, in and of itself, is a very basic skill, it isn't? It's not yes. somewhat. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Because I think you have a, a, a richer understanding than I do. I was really grateful to have a conversation with Stephen Wolfram. And Ellen November's Building Learning Communities Conference in July, he was a speaker, and I got a chance to speak with him. He built the programming language that's the background for Siri. So when you ask Siri a question and it comes up with a response, that's Wolfram Alpha. So I was asking him more questions about what he imagined students would need to prepare for something like this. And he said the complexity of technology is allowing machines to actually program basic code more quickly than kids would be able to keep up with. So you either have to go really far, really fast, really deep and be able to keep up with that or really soon machines will be able to take over that basic level. And so what's more important is the computational thinking. How do we train a, a machine or a computer to do something that we want it to do in an effective way? And also how do we find the creative applications that balance who we are as humans and what machines can do to help benefit us in that kind of balance? That's a very different way of thinking and it's much harder as an educator to approach that in the classroom. It's easier to say, I'm preparing my students for the future because I taught them the steps of coding, or they've gone through hour of code, or they know how to follow directions in a list. But again, machines are really good at being able to follow directions in a list like that. And if they can process faster and deeper and much more efficiently than a human, we need to start developing the skills in humans that computers aren't as good at. So is it possible to teach cognitive thinking in and of itself, or do you need to teach cognitive thinking within a particular domain? The computational thinking idea can really go across different domains. It can happen at the same time as coding, but you need to approach coding in a different way so that you're actually struggling through it, solving problems, figuring out what things you need because it's that process of struggle and identifying the problem and figuring out what steps you would take the alternate routes. Like if there's a detour, what do you do then when something fails? That's a very different way of thinking. Um, in the book, I give some examples of how you can do that with is something as simple as a blank piece of paper and a squiggle on a piece of 
a, a page and that you create and design something because you're challenging your thinking in those different ways. So whether you have technology in the classroom right now or access or internet access or not, you can start developing that type of computational thinking, the creativity to solve problems and to um, approach thinking again across various different domains by seeing how science connects with art or how history makes sense with social studies as opposed to isolating these in silo domains. Machines can do that really well and silo things, but our brains have the capacity to make those kind of connections. And those are areas we need to continue developing in education. And as you said, in your book, you describe how teachers can incorporate, um, you know, the teaching of computational thinking, whether or not they have technology and really right. in whatever domain they happen to be teaching. So if you were a social studies teacher, you can teach cognitive, you can teach computational thinking within social right. studies. Yes. And, and that goes into the design thinking and project based learning that all of those things start helping build that flexibility and um, is a convergent and divergent thinking where you're seeing how pieces come together and how they could fit together that you normally wouldn't see. And also, if you pulled them apart again, seeing it from a different level, that's very different than memorizing something and repeating it or following a set of processes or procedures. So. Um, can you just describe a little bit convergent and divergent thinking and how that's something that the that humans can do? And I'm assuming it's something that machines don't do very well. Sure. So I, I, as many of these things, there are some very different definitions of these words, but um, it's that idea again of imagining how you can make sense of things across different domains. And I'll give the example of the movie Wally. You could take the movie Wally -E and show it to your students in the classroom and you can ask just basic questions like what were the characters names, what was the setting, and that's a very basic level. But then you can go into a deeper level and you can ask them how they see other things in their life converge with the ideas in the movie. And they're starting to get them to look at something outward, pull it in and see intersection pieces. Then you can also get them to say now separate those pieces out and how can you create something that would represent either your ideas or the concepts or the themes in there. That's taking just watching a movie passively and then responding to the basic questions to another level of creating or understanding the themes or the deeper meanings. So our class did an example where they created um, robots out of recycled materials. They could have functioned and have some kind of moving pieces, but we also looked at different ways that there are artists around the world who are making statements about pollution and using um, recycled materials to create art. So it's taking a very different domain and way of thinking and using art essentially as a, a method of activism and then saying, how does it relate to this movie? So it's taking those different ideas that seem divergent on the surface and converging them in a way to think about something in a, in a very different or new way. When we're programming for something or we're trying to come up with a new solution, those types of things help you become more successful in finding unexpected ways of approaching something. Hmm. Now, I'm thinking that there's people in who are participating here who are also very accomplished in their own right. And some of you, I'm sure have come up with your own ways of teaching computational thinking, design thinking, coding. Um, is there is there somebody who could come up and share how they're using these in 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 their schools? Um, please, you know, click on that raise hand button and come up so you so we can all hear from you as well. And. Um, oh, come on. You know, <laughs> you expect your students to raise their hands and contribute? Uh, There's a question okay. on here. So I to get a copy of the slides. Oh, um, so, you know, with your permission, yes, when I send out the uh, that there's an archive, uh, there'll be a link to download a PDF copy of the slides as well. Yes, that's fine. Okay. We can move Good. to the next slide. Okay. We actually have answered some of these questions a little bit already that a computer can't currently think or behave in the same way as a human. And in terms of a machine augmenting human capability um, and maintaining that balance, I have some slides coming up next that show some examples of what those things look like. So um, Mitch, I'll leave this up to you if you would like to open this up for discussion or collaboration or if we should keep moving on. Well, so I'd like, um, 
so I actually have, you know, when I'm seeing that first question, the thing that pops into my, my mind is that, you know, uh, you know, it says machines augment human capacity and still maintain a balance between cultural traditions and modern innovations. But on the other hand, the people who set up AI within machines have their own cultural traditions and their own blind spots. And yeah. so um, maybe you can just comment on that. Like, like what are some, maybe some examples and how we could be more aware of when machines or artificial intelligence is blind and, yeah. and also ways that we can, if we, in our use of, of AI, as we're training people in AI, how we can help our students be more aware of it and avoid it. Here's an example that I got from um, someone who's at the University of Washington graduate student. Her name is Niall Wilson, and she is working with brain computer interfaces. She's also looking at some of the things going on in the medical field and the types of brain scans that you can do to um, see the way that whether it's brain waves or the types of traces that you're looking at to find either patterns in responses or um, to try and tease out what areas of the brain are um, working or um, being affected by drugs, interactions, things like that. So what she noticed and pointed out in terms of bias is that some of the equipment does not work well with certain hair types. And so when researchers are collecting this data, they're tending to go for the ones that it picks up more easily with the types of um, equipment that's working with the type of style or the texture of hair. So in that way, they're gathering a lot of data from certain groups of people, and they're not gathering an equal balance of that uh, type of data from other people. And so what this means is as machines are starting to learn from these patterns of data, it's building in a bias to understand from one particular group of people and maybe not showing a full representation from others. So we don't know enough yet to understand what things, what biases, what differences between either genetics, backgrounds um, will influence or create more of a bias or which things are pretty standard across. But just knowing that that's one of them that can have major implications for the way that something is diagnosed or missed when someone is looking for it and says, well, a machine went through this, you don't have any of these problems, you don't have any indicators, may not necessarily be accurate. So mm -hmm. she's really looking at how we can start minimizing those type of biases by collecting the type of data that we need that are more consistent. Um, in terms of other types of biases, we just even know that um, populations in STEM fields if you're getting only one type of perspective or two types of perspectives, but not getting the types of things that people would need, how they would want to interact with these devices, how they use it, um, you're not getting a full picture of use case scenarios that could possibly benefit society. And if that marginalizes certain groups of people, they're going to be yes, less likely to use that technology. If they're less likely to use that technology, they may not have the same set of skills to offer to certain types of jobs and that can increase equity inequities and gaps in wages in types of jobs that people get. So those are some examples on that end. But at the same time, in terms of culture and tradition, there are some AI technologies that are helping bridge those gaps in terms of like natural language processing and being able to help people communicate in ways that they couldn't before. And that has the potential in a positive way to help us if we as humans choose to, to ask people questions, to challenge our own ideas. The technology mm -hmm. can exist, but if we choose not to ask those questions, then we're no better off than if we couldn't understand the language. Mm -hmm. And then, I'm not sure I saw this in the slides earlier or not, but there's been a lot of talk about use of artificial intelligence to um, direct the appropriate learning material to a student at the right time. So, um, you know, there's, there's been a couple systems that have been kind of discredited who have made huge claims that we deliver the right piece of learning to the right student at the right time because we have all these algorithms that we go through in artificial intelligence and machine learning so we know exactly what the child needs at that point in time. Um, what's the future like for those types of systems that you see? Every, I you still heard? have hope for that. Um, the Crest UCLA Research Conference had some fascinating things that people were doing for mapping mathematics, for example. Um, on one end, looking at 
I'm trying to imagine like the, the, what the map looked like and mm -hmm. how many different notes and the complexities of if you answer this part of the question or what you would do here or how you determine if it's a careless error versus not. And it was really beautiful map. I, even though I didn't understand all of how it worked, I could see that there's a massive amount of data and information for a system to be able to do that. There are some other people who have been looking at, um, even in adaptive systems like that, there are still going to be gaps that humans are help, helpful in being able to direct what is a good match for that student in terms of pacing, in terms of frustration level, in terms of motivation. And we know that humans are better at motivating many kids than machines are. So there are some people who are working with um, machines to be able to identify when someone succeeded and signal the teacher to literally go over and give a physical high five. They're finding in the data and that research that kids will respond better to that human high five than they do if they have a star that shows up on the screen. So in that way, it can help um, support the teacher in allowing the kids to progress at a different pace, but it still keeps the teacher involved. And from what I've seen, I feel that that's a really promising type of model because as a human, you cannot juggle all that information at once for all of those students. So if there's mm -hmm. something that's you, but you have the training to be able to know how to motivate a student, to encourage them, to identify their passions and help them see how to use those skills in a context in the real world. That's an essential and crucial job for a human educator. And, and I think uh, that what, one of the things that we may be seeing is that um, the key to using machine learning and artificial intelligence for that type of prescriptive teaching is what you're measuring. Um, and exactly. then being able to analyze the data. And yeah. the fact of the matter is we are not measuring the ability of kids to collaborate, to, cr to be creative, okay. uh, to problem solve. And since those are the skills that we're most in need of, what we're able to measure is some of the least important things. And maybe that gives us as educators the ability to really focus on the things that are much more important. Right. So. We can go to the next. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I'm going to go through these relatively quickly, but I wanted you to see some images of some of these things. So the cognitive systems, as I mentioned before, with IBM Watson, um, Sesame Street is partnering with them to help kids um, practice vocabulary words. So at this basic level, it's trying to adapt to challenge them to find bigger words or ones that will come at um, higher levels of reading in a game type form. So it's not far out of the ordinary of something that we might see in type of gamified learning, but it's using the power of IBM and Watson to help drive that forward with the hope that ultimately higher levels of vocabulary will help with reading progression and some of those pieces. Um, the panel on the side with the machine learning future and Alan Turing natural language processing, that's a series on PBS crash course um, that talks about these different topics at various levels. So if you're interested in learning more about those, those are on YouTube. Um, this piece on the side, um, most of us have probably had an experience with CAPTCHA, where you're trying to type in a word or a phrase to show that you're not a robot. And that's one of those texts because humans can see the nuances in the shapes of words and lettering where computers don't see that yet. And that's how we can tell that a human sees and is able to process those types of nuances differently. Right below that square is an example of um, AI-based translator. And I know that Google is also doing some of those things. Microsoft Translator is using natural language processing to not only capture voice and then translate it, but then also type and then be able to translate it back. Um, a lot of very interesting features are pulling into that on mobile as well. We can move to the next one. Um, this is another example of adaptive technology I was mentioning with math. Our school actually uses the McGraw-Hill Alex program. It's A-L-E-K-S. And this is a pie chart example of one of the students in the class who volunteered to give hers. Those topics on the side talk about the topics that we want to see the kids master. 
as they're going through those different topics, that pie chart starts to fill up. And there are intersections between these different topics in mathematics. So you may have a gap in something like the algebra and geometry review, and it'll identify those gaps by finding which questions you consistently are answering incorrectly. And then it'll try to determine if it was a careless error or if it was a conceptual level, and then fill in some of those pieces by suggesting other problems. It has something similar to what I was mentioning that it gives a signal to the teacher of groupings of students and things that they're ready to learn so that you can give direct instruction to those students. So it's not all just behind or does not have to be all behind just a computer screen. We can move to the next one. Um, this is what the dashboard looks like for the students so they can see data in their own progress. Um, it's beneficial for the students because for some, it adds a level of motivation and for them to persist and keep going. We've had students who in normal traditional class settings would have been bored and shut off because they weren't allowed to progress faster. But with this, they were able to demonstrate their mastery much quicker. And some of them have gone through the equivalent of two full years of mathematics in one year and some two and a half. And they are now in early entry college. So our school goes up to 10th grade, 11th and 12th grade. They're in dual enrollment in college and community college. So some of those students, because they got to the calculus level as 10th graders, they're able to go through more complex levels in those first two years of high uh, college, the last two years of high school. And one of them, for example, decided now she wants to go into quantum computing because she's just really fascinated by this topic. Tools like this allow us to help adapt that type of learning for students, but it still requires an educator who can motivate, who knows where that nuance is and how to challenge them, and who knows how to help explain and keep moving them forward. And we can go to the next example. Pixar in a box. Pixar Animation Studio partnered with Khan Academy. So they've got free lessons on there, some beautiful STEM design where they're showing how their animators are using science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics in a way to create and model the movies and the films that kids love. So as I talk to some of the people who are using machine learning for um, noise reduction in some of the animations they're using. They gave this particular lesson as an example that's helping prepare kids for the type of uh, mindset that they need when they're using machine learning and modeling. Um, so it must be fascinating for, it must, must be fascinating for kids to, to learn that even in something like m movie making, they need to learn STEM skills. Yes, exactly. Right? and be able to see people who are really using in their jobs daily. Yeah. These are screenshots of a tool called Sway from Microsoft. It's free tool. My students use it quite a bit and we have kids as young as four and five years old who are using it independently. Um, that top screen shows an example of the types of design features that are there. If you're not familiar with this, you can imagine if you're trying to create a PowerPoint, your students are trying to create a PowerPoint, you need to put a substantial amount of effort to make those slides look aesthetic. So as a child, the cognitive load that's required to think about design, think about the content, think about the spelling, think about the grammatical structure, all of that can feel like cognitive overload for kids. What this does is uses machine learning to design the layout and keep it looking consistent and professional at any point along the way. So if you're looking at the bottom left screen, those break apart pieces are, imagine them as like um, electronic note cards. Those note cards allow you to embed pieces of media. You can drag and drop them and move them. And then when you push play, it will create a design that looks like a website for you. And you can tap it to remix the designs. You can come up with swaying up and down like a website or side to side. It also has a search feature that uses machine learning for um, Creative Commons licensed content. And so that helps facilitate that cognitive load for kids. One less thing for them to worry about is they're creating original content. So this is an example of how an educator can help practice not only the computational thinking, but help them get practice in connecting multiple subjects. And their cognitive energy can be focused on that as opposed to working on the design at the same time. When they start seeing the effectiveness of the design, you can ask them as an educator, what made this font look effective? Why do you think this layout piece was good? And that can become a training tool for them when they start creating their own original designs. Move to the next one. 
And then this is a student in my class who wants to go into astrophysics. She created this slide and I forgot to mention each one of these previous slides of examples are my student created slides because they presented with me and talked about different ways they're currently using AI in the classroom, subtle ways, not so obvious ways. But Ronwen wanted to talk about how she is um, looking at a career in NASA and how AI is starting to identify things that we couldn't see or identify humanly possible with the complexity, with the distance, with not being able to see it with our own eyes. So she's become really fascinated in something that feels more sci-fi, but that's actually in existence now. And we can move on to the next one. And Facebook and autonomous vehicles, the kids decide to put those two together because there are AI features with suggestions on Facebook or that try to determine which types of posts you would more likely appreciate. It could happen with marketing. Um, in terms of autonomous vehicles, what we know about it is that there are a lot of things that have progressed with it, but you can hear things in media, as you said, with extremes that scare people of car crashes. Um, we also know that it's not a matter of just saying, here's a car, start driving autonomously. There's a massive amount of data, again, that needs to go into mapping the territory and the terrain that needs to identify where the stoplights are. And all of that groundwork has to be done by a human first before it can travel within those spaces that it works. So there are a lot of complex pieces um, that are necessary for it to work, and it's still not perfect yet. So, for example, um, if a truck is driving perpendicular to this white vehicle that you're seeing straight ahead, if the sensor ahead cannot see a big distance or um, that gap space under the truck between the two wheels could look like it's a clear space going ahead as opposed to seeing something blocking it or an object in the way. And that could send um, an incorrect signal so that the car thinks there's nothing in its way and it doesn't stop in time. That was an example that someone gave a complex idea of how these pieces intersect in traffic patterns. So we can move on to the next one. And this is where some of the ethics come in in a really powerful way. As people are programming things for like driverless vehicles, it's no longer a matter of if a collision happens, it's when a collision happens, what does the vehicle do to respond? So the, the video that uh, hopefully you all got a chance to watch on the trolley problem gave an example of driverless vehicles and how do you determine what does the car do? Does it avoid the collision? Does it hit something else? Does it minimize the damage to itself versus something else. And this all brings in philosophical considerations. So as educators, we prepare kids to be in a world where AI exists, it's going to benefit them to really start grappling with philosophy concepts early on. Do you have anything you want to mention on that or we can move on to the next? No, I thought that was a really a fascinating example because, um, well, is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching people about sense making and this is an example of how a machine has to make sense out of a situation and weigh yeah. um you know moral issues is it i to me i i think this is the one where um if uh if you were called on um the, they had the example of the train okay the train yeah. is on a track that it could hit five people but um, mm -hmm. There's an alternative track, and you have the option. If you had the option of switching the train to an alternative track where it would hit one person, would you do that? And 90% right. of the people would do that. But if you were on a bridge and the train was coming and you had to push a person off the bridge and have that person stop the train and die, 90% of the people would not push the person off the, off the bridge, whereas numerically, it's the same choice. I mean, right. it's kind of a fascinating question. And then seeing the different populations of people, more men versus women deciding on certain outcomes, or yep. if it was a man versus a woman or a child, which life is more valuable, according yep. to people who are making that decision. And I talked right. to several people about this too and said, okay, so let's say that a vehicle determines we've got all this data on Fitbits. We know how old a person is. What if it determines that the person who is younger should be prioritized over the person who's older because the person who's younger hasn't lived as long? Then what if you throw in the equation, 
or the question and thought experiment, what if the person who is older is a heart surgeon and losing their life is decreasing the chance of them being able to save someone else's and the younger person is someone who's been involved in crime and not contributing to society? What do we do then at that level? So mm -hmm. that's where it gets really messy, really scary, really fast. And what type of data are we collecting? What type of data are we offering of ourselves? And how might people choose to use that someday outside of our control? And that's where it can get in the level of sci-fi freaky. Yeah. Um, those are all areas we have to watch out for. Yeah, that was fascinating to me. And so I we guess we, get, we come up for it. Go ahead. I was saying we talked about this one quite a bit already. Yep. With different okay. types of bias, and and we're and we're actually past our time anyhow. So maybe we should <laughs> move on past yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and then this one was talking about uh, we can start working with our kids through storytelling to help them develop empathy and start thinking about different scenarios. One of my professors uh, was on education, leadership, and policy studies, Roger Soder, I asked him what he wished educators would know, even though his background is not in AI, because if we're looking at society and we're looking at what do we want our communities and our world to become, he's the person who's been studying this. And he gave me an example of a story of a headmaster who was recounting a time um, where he was with two students and he watched the different reactions of two students when a little baby became violently ill on a train with a mother who was by herself. One picked up a handkerchief and cleaned up the mother and the little baby and showed compassion and jumped in that messy space. The other one hid behind the copy of the Times. So I love hmm. that as analogy because as these things get really messy in life and in complexity with philosophy with psychology, with what is the balance? We have an option as educators to engage with these messy things or to hide behind the times. And if we want to create a society where people actually care about this, we need to model it. We need to be the ones who are saying, this is messy, I don't understand it, but I'm gonna do whatever I can to try and understand. I'm gonna do what I need to do to help build the character in my students, in myself and model that and not be afraid and hide behind those things. And we can do those as educators by using stories like that as part of our other to the topics that we're teaching. We can fold yeah, that into social exactly. studies or we can fold that into ELA yeah. or science. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Oh, and the trolley problem. Well, we kind of talked about yeah. that, right? Yeah, you can move on because it's just flipped around okay. different order. <laughs> and then this was an example of um, Hal, uh, for those of you who watched the movie. And when I first watched this, I thought, oh, it's showing an evil robot. I talked to my brother about it. He said, no, it's not an evil robot. It was given a mission and the humans got in the way of its mission. When the humans got in the way of its mission, those humans died. So it wasn't that it was evil. It followed the plan that someone designed it to do. And you look at that throughout different science fiction movies. And when he gave me that lens, that became more compelling. What is it that we're programming our machines to do? And are we thinking through the implications for humanity? You see that in the movie Tron Legacy as well, um, when they want to create a perfect system. And they think if we've got this essentially AI that's figuring out what makes perfection, that in essence created something entirely dystopian. And that's one of the things that we do see as valuable in science fiction writing, because it's trying to get us to think about complex issues that could exist or already do exist at maybe a smaller scale level, but abstract mm -hmm. it in a strong enough way that it feels removed from us so that we're willing to listen to it and engage with it as opposed to being in denial. Yeah, big questions. And then did you want to mention anything about the locker problem? Um, so, uh, so now I saw the movie and now I just, I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. So I'm so sorry. Um, no but I think, didn't, didn't you cover this or, or, oh, you know, I guess you didn't cover it where, um, where you can figure out, um, you know, uh, but I'm not sure. I'm, I wasn't sure of the link between the locker problem and artificial intelligence. So here's a person who was given a, a, a riddle by her grandfather who passed away so that she could, um, outsmart her relatives and come up with a way of, of getting the fortune. But how does that relate to AI? 
I would say the thought process that it's easy to say, well, there's no way we can possibly figure this out, but that um, there are things that we can get around or figure out in a different way by perceiving it, by looking at it from a different angle. And those things can be really compelling in terms of convergent and divergent thinking. We can get stuck with a one track mind with that one trolley that we're going down that one way, or we can start mm -hmm. saying, wait a minute, there could be a different angle of approaching this. And by mm -hmm. practicing a flexibility of thought like this, early on with kids, getting them to look at paradoxes and some of those other concepts, mm -hmm. it will better prepare them to have the grit and determination to get through some of these challenges that they'll experience. Thank you. Thank you. Important, those are important <laughs> points. Okay. And actually, I'm going to skip through this because I, yeah. I'm getting like like um, pings from Shindig that were out of time. So I'm going to skip and to, I think this was your last. Right yeah. That these are a few of the students that helped contribute to the book. And so the book has voice from global educators, from researchers, experts in the field, and student voice. And I wanted it to be a broad representation because if we're talking about bias, I needed to model that in the book so that we are decreasing bias by getting as many perspectives mm -hmm. as possible. And how many um, how many sessions are you teaching at FETC? Are you leading? Um, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I believe it's four and then the author session. And then wow. I'm working with, um, with a couple of other teachers. We have two other teachers who will be there and student presenters as well. Wow. And you'll be, you'll be there. You said the author session. So you'll be signing your book at FETC also. Yes, you will. Right. Okay. So, um, yeah, so, uh, this it's, it's a must read. Um, and uh, Michelle is a must see at FETC. I hope that you all come and um, and and enjoy FETC and 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 talk to Michelle. Um, any last words? Any any ending? Just that this is a place that it's really worth engaging and not giving up on, whether you have a background in computer science or not. This book was intended to reach people through storytelling, through looking at various different domains. So it's not just for someone who has a background in computer science. There are things that you can do wherever you teach that can help prepare the kids for the future. Um, so with that, thank you. I'm so sorry that I extended things with all with butting in and asking questions and having the no, discussion. But thank you so much. Um, I learned. I learned so much. I always learn a lot when I talk with you. So thank you. Thank you. And Thank you. Look forward to seeing you at FETC. You too. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> good night, Michelle, and good night, everybody else. Uh, this is Mitch Weisberg uh, signing off for EdChat Interactive. Hope to see you in a few weeks down in Orlando, Florida for FETC and online. And don't forget, we have another interesting session next week. So, uh, good night.